continuing with the holy work of Rabbi Yonason Steif, Mitzvah Hashem, the the commands of God Almighty that apply to every single human being. And we know that the word mitzvah means a, it's a means of connection. It means a connection from the infinite to the finite. We are the finite. We're obviously finite human beings. And God Almighty is infinite. But in aligning our thinking, our speech, and our action with God Almighty, that's how we are in the groove, so to speak. We're in the, the smooth lane, the, the, um, the, the good lane of life, um that we we know that we're doing and we're conducting ourselves the way we're supposed to conduct ourselves just like with physical things we want to make sure that we are conscious of the laws of gravity and we don't go and do things that are going to lead to unpleasant results because the laws of gravity apply all the time so too the spiritual laws apply all the time we don't always see the results immediately and so what we're going to learn today is actually a, a very um, um, refined understanding of the degree to which we have to separate ourselves from idolatry. We all know that we cannot worship idols, that to just go and believe and declare that something else is uh, a god, some sort of form, some sort of physical being, some sort of idea, These are that's, that's a god. Um, we know that's forbidden. And you can say, okay, that makes sense. But let's take it a step further and see how far we have to separate ourselves from it. We have to separate ourselves to an extent that we don't even benefit from it, even in a roundabout way. And let's look inside now and see the degree to which we have to keep ourselves from anything that's connected with denying or limiting, denying God Almighty or limiting his powers or limiting his um, all-powerfulness. So we're going to pull, pull up the uh, screen over here. And we are on chapter nine in the section on the laws of idolatry. And we have over here, we're not allowed to benefit from idolatry. And this corresponds to the Sefer Chinuch, the mitzvah, the 429th mitzvah, mitzvah tov chof tes. He continues over here in the title. This is referring to whether it is the actual idol, the idolatry itself, the accessories to the idolatry, and the offerings that are brought up to the idolatry. So basically anything associated with the idolatry, even things that are um, secondary to it, even things that are just brought as offerings to it, that in themselves were not prohibited or problematic, but once they become offered into the service of an idol, they become forbidden to even have benefit from them. Uh, the service of stars, meaning idolatry, and the thing, its accessories, the things that are functioning in the service of that idolatry, and its offerings, and everything that's made for it, it's forbidden to benefit from it. We're going to look this over. This is Deuteronomy um, chapter 4, verse 5. Yeah, Deuteronomy chapter 4. We always say we have to go to, to the verses, look them up, make sure we understand them, see them in context, and then learn even more. So, add to the share over here. So, I'm hoping that you can see here the web page here, which has Deuteronomy chapter 7, uh, verse 26. 
let's see what that means. It says, don't bring any sort of abomination into your house. And then it says, Vaisa Chem Kamehu, lest you should become destroyed like it. Um, then it says, you shall uh, detest it, utterly detest it, and utterly abhor it, because it is to be destroyed. So we see over here, if we bring the abomination into our houses, even if it's we're not serving it, but that is putting us at risk of meeting the same fate that is meant to be for things that are going against God Almighty. So let's go back here to the Irish Taif, and we'll see that it says, so it says, how do we know that we're forbidden in uh, benefiting from anything to do with idolatry, whether it's the thing itself, the idolatry itself, the accessories or the offerings to that idolatry? Because it says in this verse, don't bring any abominable, abominable thing into your house. And so anyone who benefits from this, then he is receives lashes, is corporal punishment, not a capital punishment, but it's a corporal punishment, twice. One is that you should not bring it into your house. And you should not allow to be attached to your hands anything from the things that are to be destroyed. And Avedizar is called everything that is made into a god, whether it is a Nochri made it, or you saw whether it's a non-Jewish person made it, or a Jewish person made it. And we learn that an Id what idolatry made by a non-Jewish person is immediately forbidden, and what is made by a Jewish person is forbidden, um, not in potential, but once it's actually served. So this idolatry is going to be forbidden for us to have anything to do with it, any benefit whatsoever from it. Now in paragraph two, this is how far we have to stay away from it. It's forbidden to benefit from idolatry in any way whatsoever, even listening to it or smelling it or Berea or in seeing it. Even if you smell the incense that they make and put on the um, offerings of idolatry, the incense offerings, that is forbidden. And we say that a person who goes in the marketplace of idolatry, meaning to say, a place where idolaters are um, selling their wares and they're they're doing um or, or it's, it could be a marketplace of a um, house of worship and so forth and you're having an experience of smelling the incenses and the spices and the things that they're doing uh, as part of their idolatry this is called a sinful thing to do because you're really being even though you're even if you're not in intention we're going to see if if you put yourself in a situation like this, um, then that's problematic. I am Psochim and seeing the Talmud Psochim La Inyan Kailumara Arech Bahektish. And let's see over there concept of a, of a sound and a sight and a uh, smell of things that are hektish, meaning the things that are um, holy in the temple. So those things we have to be aware of that um, even though the Ain Bahem Ilah. These are not tangible things that they are. Um, there's a concept called me'ila, which means to say that if you designate something for a holy purpose and then you make use of it, let's say you take a, um, a bull or a sheep and you say, I'm, I'm dedicating this to the temple or, or some other thing. You want to dedicate something to the temple and, and then you go ahead and you decide that you want to use that sheep and you want to shear it. Maybe you want to uh, eat it for dinner. And you go ahead and prepare it and you cook it. Well, there's a big problem over here because what you did is you took something that was designated for holy purposes and you've now 
made use of it for mundane purposes. You violated, so to speak, your commitment to use it for a holy purpose. So that applies for things that are tangible. But what about the sounds? What about sights? What about smells? And the answer is they don't have this status because they're not tangible. They're not something that you can misuse it for some mundane purpose. Mikomokom. Nevertheless, even though it doesn't fall into that tangible tangibility category, nevertheless, isurish, it's still forbidden. But And this it brought it's brought there in the Talmud that actually a smell, a, a reach, a smell, has a physical element to it. Um that's something that we see it because it, it actually actually dissipates the physical smell elements in the air they dissipate and then after a while you can't smell it and the, there's an opinion that it actually has can be misused if it's um even something that was designated a smell that was designated for holy purposes but once it's um there's a question here when once it's already um used out in the, the commandments for in the, in the holy temple, there was a requirement to bring certain incest offerings. Once it's already used out, then it's it's less problematic. But aim kain bereach chomor isura gam beoyvadizor. So we see from this that um, that the smell has even a status of of being of a certain tangibility to it. So then it is something that is a tangible experience in taking benefit from idolatry. And that's that's a problem. But, and we said this, it's forbidden. Next paragraph. Now, we're going to take it even a step further. So we have over here that we have a, a thought that there's a physical aspect to a smell. And if you're smelling the smells and benefiting from the smells that are made by uh, in the service of idolatry, that's problematic. But what about if they're playing music for idolatry? It's forbidden to hear the sound of songs for idolatry. Or the melodies of the priests that they play these melodies for idolatry. And it's forbidden to look at the beauty of, of an idol if you're benefiting from that seeing it. And even the um, pleasure or the benefit that comes to a person against his will. Let's see what that's going to mean when it turns to the page over here. Let's see this fascinating concept that what does it mean if it's against your will well that's going to see here make this a little larger um even if it was you you didn't put yourself intentionally voluntarily in that place but if you have intention to now benefit from it it's forbidden and this falls into the category of something called psik resha, which means to say, um, there's certain things where your, um, how would you say it, the consequences are so inevitable you can't possibly have conceived of doing something without that consequence. So, for example, if you have a chicken, the, the case brought in the, in the Talmud is, you have a chicken, and you are going to say, I, I, don't, I, didn't, I took off its head, but I didn't mean to kill it. Let's say on Shabbos, or, I, I didn't mean to kill it. I, I, I cut off the head of the chicken. I, I separated the head. I didn't mean to kill it. What do you mean? It's impossible to separate the head off a chicken without it dying, without it being killed. So we see that there's a concept in the Torah of something, well, if you, even though you didn't intend to do, you didn't intend, intend to kill the chicken, you just wanted to remove its head from its body. 
But the inevitability of the death of the chicken when you remove the head from the body is sufficient to ascribe to you the culpability, the responsibility for killing the chicken. So, so let's say it's impossible for you to now close your eyes or to close your ears. As a filish animus cabin, also come up hope, seek ration, behold her. You you are still considered culpable because you put yourself in a situation, even though you don't intend to benefit from this sight or this sound, um, it's like every inevitable situation. So let's just give an example over here. If you um, go and you put yourself in the town, let's say you, you put yourself in a, uh, you know there's gonna be a parade of some idolatry. And they're going to be parading with their flutes and their drums and stuff like that. And they're going to be singing songs to idolatry. So you go and you take your, um, uh, well, I mean, okay, let's, we'll be, well, uh, let's say um, it's a situation that you was, you didn't intend the situation. Let's we're testing with this example. You go ahead and um, you're driving in your car. Okay, here's an example. What would be, what would be you're forced, so to speak. You're driving your car and you are you get stuck in traffic and you're in traffic right in front of a musical band, some sort of host of idolatry, some sort of event of idolatry, and they're playing music for the idolatry or they're, um, you see things or you smell things. So you didn't choose to be in that place in time. So you are not responsible for getting there. But if you now choose to benefit from it, you're like, hmm, that's a really nice smell. Oh, I like that music. I like that tune. That's a beautiful sight. I like the colors of their dresses, uh, their, their uniforms. I like the colors of the flags they're flying, whatever, whatever idolatry they're, whatever things in service of idolatry they're doing, the different um, images. That is forbidden. And if you put yourself in a situation where, so that, that you didn't choose, but even if you put yourself in a situation where it was inevitable, um, so you, you decide you're going to, you, there's going to be a parade, and now you, you choose to put a, um, you put a uh, chair, you're going to take your folding chair, and you're going to just sit there and you're going to read an interesting um, just read something interesting and uh, now comes along the marching band you knew they were coming and you're like oh but but now I can't get away it's, it's I can't get out of here and I can't close my eyes and I can't close my ears I don't really want to benefit from this I'm not interested in their music I, I just I, I'm sitting here so the answer is you knew that there was going to be this parade you are sitting there now you're claiming that oh I didn't I I, I would co I can't I cover my eyes and close my ears if I could but I can't. Now that's not called being forced. That's an absolutely foreseeable inevitability of you being in that place in time, and you put yourself in that place in time. So if you're going to go to um, a uh, you want to go to the park, and next to the park is a, a house of idolatry, and you're going to set up your uh, on a time when they're playing their music and they're doing their services and they're doing their songs in their temple of idolatry and you're going to um, sit there and you're like I I, um, I have no interest in benefiting from this I'm not thinking that this is a nice song and I really enjoy it but you are putting yourself you, you didn't intend you didn't, like it says, as if you listen up Miss Cavan, you didn't intend to benefit, but it's impossible not to be the recipient of this music and this smell and this experience when you're going to do this thing. This is an inevitable consequence of choosing to sit right here in this, um, in this park right next to this house of idolatry. So if, however, if you're sitting in a park and there's no host of idolatry whatsoever and some people come up, sit next to you and um, they, you know, you can't get away for some reason and they start doing, playing their idolatrous music, well, then 
the answer would be, well, at least don't intend to benefit from it and don't and don't benefit from it. You know, you'd have to keep your mind that this is not this is idolatry and so forth. If you were stuck in a situation because you you didn't set yourself up to be there, you were forced. It's another example, but the example of getting stuck in the traffic before, or you put in a situation where all of a sudden they come and, and you can't not able to get away from the situation. Okay, so this is telling us something very, very important. We cannot take benefit from things that are fighting against God, that are going against God. We can't like indulge ourselves in that experience of oh, that's a really, really ah, that's a really good song. It's a good melody. Um, there's there's music. There's a lot of classical music that's written specifically for the purpose of idolatry and praising and, and worshiping and so forth, and for in the service of idolatry. Um, so you have to be really, really conscious of this. Now it's very, very tempting to say, "Oh well, I am, um, I am, I'm not really, I'm not really, uh, I'm not interested in idolatry, but I like this music, I like this song." And you have to be very, very careful. What are you benefiting from? And um, and what are you allowing yourself to enjoy? Now, it's not about not having a joyful life and enjoying life. There's many, 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 many beautiful things to enjoy in life. And there's no shortage of them. So we just have to make sure to enjoy the things. And it's, it's normal to hear a good melody. And when you hear a good melody, you enjoy it. So we have to make sure we don't hear the melodies that are dedicated to or part of the service of idolatry. And same thing with the sights and the sound, the sights and the sounds and the smells. Paragraph 3, Gimel. So just like it's forbidden to benefit from idolatry, it's forbidden to bring benefit to the idolatry. So what would be an example? Someone whose house is next to the house of idolatry, the Nafal, and his house falls down. Also, he can't rebuild his house. You're going to benefit them by building them a wall. So let's say you have two houses, maybe with a shared a wall in common, and one is a idolatrous temple, uh, some sort of house of idolatry, and your house is next to it. Your house collapses and the wall comes down. So you say, "Oh, I want to rebuild the house," but in your building that house, you're rebuilding that you're building a wall for them. So you can't rebuild your house. So what are you going to do? Kate said, yeah. So how could you deal with the situation? You could move your, when you're going to rebuild your house, move your house for Amos. Each Amma is a, is a measurement in, in the Torah that's about 18 inches, a foot and a half. So four Amos is about six feet. Move your wall in six feet onto your property so that no longer benefits them. If you only move it in a few inches, they can better still benefit from the effect of your wall because it's going to block the sun and the wind and the rain and uh, the air to a certain extent, even if there's cracks around it. But you have to move in six feet and there you are no longer bringing benefit to that idolatry by building your rebuilding your house. It's also forbidden to build with a non-Jewish person who's an idolater, a kippa. A kippa is referring to a dome. So they build these domes, especially in old architecture, build domes. And these domes would be used to house, to put up in them idolatrous images and, and statues and so forth. So this is forbidden to do because you're, even though you're, you're creating this dome and let's say you're going to say, okay, to the, to the other fellow, you're going to say, oh, this half is mine and that half is yours. But since it's under a common dome, you've got a problem because you're building, you're making something that's benefiting his idolatry. 
אבל בין ההוא לכתחילה, הטרקלין, you could build at the, you could build the, at the outset, you could set up to build a banquet hall or a big hall. Or, or a courtyard that has within it some sort of dome. It is a something of use for something of use, meaning to say it's not, um, let's say, a hall. You're building a big room, a uh, um, vent center or some of that. You're, that has uh, many uses, and it's not something that is typically used for the idolatry. And if he's going to then use it afterwards to put his idolatry in it, then that wasn't your intention. That was not necess- that was not foreseeable. You, you didn't it wasn't a um, um, a part of your project. But if you build a dome, this this um, this structure that is by definition going to be used for idolatry, even though your part is not going to be used for idolatry, then you can't do it because you're benefiting him. So you could build a, a hall. You could build a courtyard. That has within it some type of um, dome because you, the courtyard has other functions, and uh, therefore you, that's that's permissible to do. Paragraph four. Ginais v'chanius shalavidizar also lischer b'hem. Gardens and stores of idolatry is forbidden to. Um, to rent from them, to um, and also um, when you have collectors, okay, here, great question. Okay, why don't we pause for the question? Would practical examples for avoiding associated associations with ideology be like, be like not hanging up a Buddha painting at home even for decoration purposes, or not using incense sticks, or not buying at an esotericism shop. So um, any form of idolatry, a person is not allowed to maintain the image of it. We learned last week that, for example, in, in the eighth chapter, uh, you can't make the statute of a man even for just enjoyment. Um, so if that was just any man sitting there and you tried a statue or a picture, that would be a problem. Um, and f- for sure it's a problem if it's an idol, whether it's a picture or a actual form, uh, a, a um, graven image or a statue. There's some questions whether or not you could have paintings and pictures and stuff of that when first um, photogra- photography came out. Uh, many God-fearing Jews were opposed to it completely because they felt it was a, pr- a violation of the prohibition of making an image. Some people are still very stringent about that. And um, some people are more lenient about that today, especially when it comes to, uh, let's say, family pictures or, um, or let's say, pictures of righteous people where it's going to increase your f- fear and increase your uh, awe of, of the service of God Almighty because you're going to see the picture of a righteous person and it's going to inspire you to emulate him and to serve God Almighty. So that is generally considered, although there's people who don't do that today even, but that's today people are more lenient in that regard. But if it's a picture that's of, of idolatry, then it's it's definitely forbidden to put that up at home or your office or anywhere else or have it in your car or any of these types of places. Um so that's even if it's decoration purposes, even if you just like the color or you like the shape or you think it's a relaxing scene or whatever it is, and that, that idolatry is in it, then that's definitely um, problematic. Um, using incense sticks, also, there's a couple challenges in the incense sticks. So um, one is you have to be careful because we're not allowed to do the th- create the incense that is uh, used in the Holy Temple. So you have to understand what the what those things are. We can, we cannot replicate the service of the holy temple outside the holy temple. So even though the temple is not built right now, uh, and we can't bring the the, the karhanim, the priests can't bring the proper incense offering, we still cannot emulate that and make the same mixtures. Um, and also, if those incense sticks are intended for idolatry, 
then that's very much problematic. If you're going to the store and you're buying, they sell these sticks that you soak them in the water, whatever, and, and they create a uh, pleasant smell and you put them in the, you know, different parts of the house that might need some a smell, a uh, pleasant smell, then uh, that is something that you're, you're not buying an item of idolatry. You're, presumably, if you're buying it in like a home goods store and they're just selling it as uh, pleasant smelling sticks. But if you're going to a place that says, here are incense sticks for the service of this type of, some type of idolatry, then that would be, that's something you can't do that. I'm not what is sure what an esoterism shop is. Maybe I'll actually look that up. Um, and uh, so I could try to answer that. Um, what's the definition here? Um, so I, I got, I'm presuming that it means, uh, yeah, no problem if you don't, I don't have to call them the shop either, but all these kind of um, things that are selling all kinds of magical stuff and, you know, um, images and, and uh, cards, you have card stuff. Okay. So yeah, uh, tarot cards probably. And all these kind of things that are, that these are all violating different prohibitions, either of idolatry or consulting spirits or divining the future, um, trying to uh, see what the future is going to be. These are all violations of different commandments. And so a shop like that, that's going to be selling that is really not an appropriate place to be. And it's for sure forbidden to buy the, um, the, uh, the, the things that are intended for indulgence. But even if you go in and you just want to buy, uh, they sell pencils. You know, we, we had a discussion earlier whether the concept of Moiris Ayin, the concept of what how it's going to appear to others, that it's going to look like you're ratifying this place is a, a proper place to go shopping. We had a discussion of whether or not it applies to a Ben Neyach, to a non-Jewish person, because it's a rabbinical decree. And we had a question whether rabbinical decrees perhaps are only applying to, um, to Jewish people. But the, we learned that there is an opinion that the rabbinical decrees also apply to the non-Jews. And plus we said, well, one second, let's leave aside the source of the decree for a second. When you're leaving your life as an upright human being and you want to, A, not expose yourself to what the store is selling and the images and the smells you walk in there that's full of all kinds of incenses and smells and sounds and the music they're playing. So you're not even allowed to go in there in the first place. And even if theoretically you could go in when uh, you know it was all closed and there was nothing burning and there was all was, you know all that kind of stuff, but the fact of the matter is, why would you want to send a message to your fellow human being, an incorrect message that somehow oh, you know so and so is going there and this person he or she is a righteous, um, pious person from among the nations if they're going they must be okay, so you want to you you want to be conscious of that so i'm saying there's m many different angles on watch that the product is not permissible the um even if not every single product is not permissible I mean, they might sell water there or something, but you could get water elsewhere um so the product is not permissible the the main product of the store is not permissible the environment of the store is not permissible you're going to be exposing yourself to forbidden ideas um, you're going to be forbidding, for exposing yourself to sights, sounds, and smells that are forbidden to benefit from. And uh, it's going to give the wrong appearance. Now, this would be a perfect example, I think, of where we said the secret of the concept before, that you go into a place and then you say, well, I didn't intend, I don't want to benefit from this smell. I don't want to uh, benefit from the sound. What, no, one second. It's, in, it's inevitable. You, you knew when you went into the store that there's going to be smells and sounds and sights and things, and you're going to you're going to say, "Oh, that's a nice smell." And even if you don't intend to smell it, you say, I, "I I don't like the smell. I'm not going to smell it." But you've now set yourself in a situation of psikresha that it's forbidden to do this because there's no way for you not to come to an experience of having the experience of being on the receiving end from the sight, sounds, and smell. Someone unmuted themselves. You want to ask a question? Yes, Rabbi. I'm sorry, I, I don't have a way of typing in questions. Oh, that's okay. Um, uh, I had an experience, and I at the time I had my spirit, I felt it was 
wrong, but there's a salon that you come into for uh, haircuts and pedicures and nail salons and that sort of thing. And uh, on the floor, uh, in right as you walk in the door, there's this golden statue of a, of a man and there's incense burning and there's fruit all around it. And I looked at that and I said, oh my gosh, you know, that is, that's awful. <laughs> and my niece was with me and she said, well, you know, we're here to get services. We got, we, you know, we can't stop now. And I said, I felt really bad being there, but so that would be something that you, you, you can't go back in there. It's idol worship, right? Well, that's idolatry what they're doing. Yes. And you're, you're putting yourself in a situation where you don't have any choice but to benefit from this and you know but now you know about it in advance um so the difference would be let's say you go into a place some of the time you go to places people wear crosses let's say they would cross and i think so a cross doesn't provide any sound it's not a sight that you say oh that's a beautiful i mean that's a beautiful thing it's it's a it's a form it's a geometric form which is dedicated to idolatry but it's not like uh, i mean maybe they make them in gold and all kinds of fancy things but i'm saying a general situation so if the store owner has one on the side um and you're not you're not serving it as an idolatry and you're not benefiting from it um and there's no smell coming from it then that would be a different situation situation you could could go into that store and you could buy something from a person that is uh puts up that symbol on his store um assuming he's not doing it in a way that he's forcing you to acknowledge it. So if he puts it in a way that you have to bow down to get through to, you know, the situations we discuss uh, that you cannot bow down um, to it. So like if he puts, makes a low doorway and the other side of the room is uh, some sort of cross and you have to bow down to it, that would be, you can't do that because he's intending for you to bow. Or if you, we said, learned in previous chapters that if you have a, uh, a, you get a thorn in your shoe, you can't bow, to, you know, you want to pick up your, foot and bow to re reach your foot you can't do that in front of uh, an item of idolatry so but that you are have to be conscious of when you're in this place and it has this thing but this this store was not set up for idolatry and he's not actively worshiping right now he's not requiring that you worship it you're not benefiting from it and sight sound or smell however okay. however yeah. in your situation there's a completely different situation there's a there's a religious ceremony going on an idolatrous ceremony going on they're they're um they're not just egg, putting up a picture of their god what they call their god and like kind of acknowledging that they're um that, that this is their god but they are actually conducting a service where they're putting in a way that um is you're, you're looking at the statute now which is probably an aesthetically pleasing statute um yeah. There may be music with it. I can't remember if you mentioned music. No, um, there's no music. Was... But, there's the, but there's incense. They're 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 burning yes. incense for yeah. this idol. And you're right. And now you're sitting there, and you're you are benefiting from this. So remember, we said you're putting yourself in a situation where inevitably you're going to smell it, and then inevitably it's going to smell good, right? If you're sitting in the salon chair, and from the window outside comes someone from a different building or different the parking lot, someone's doing incense idolatry. It comes through, and you don't intend to benefit from it. You didn't have any choice about that. You can't. You're not. You're not uh, responsible for that. But you're coming now into a place that is filling the space with a smell devoted to an idolatry, and it's clearly for an idolatry. It's not that they're burning yeah. in the corner, and you're not. Maybe they're just doing it for air freshening. They're clearly doing for dollars. So I, I would say that this is not a place that you should go to. Right. I quit going. Right. So that's a great that's yeah. a great question. That's a really, really practical question. And and we need oh. to let people know about that. We can't, we can't say, oh, what, Deborah, that's their thing. It doesn't affect me. This is this is the incredible point over here yes. of, of what we're learning today is that it's not merely about uh what my intention is in the sense i'm not serving it you went in there you didn't serve the idol i'm not going to serve the idol um what does it matter if they're just doing their thing no their thing is causing an effect on me through the enjoyment of the sight the sounds and the smells and i have to separate myself from that yes yes and they always say oh you have to be tolerant of other people's beliefs and religions and i go no you you just don't associate with that sort of thing because i felt very uncomfortable in there well, the Torah is telling us don't allow these things into your home because 
it's it's putting you at risk. That's what we the verse yes. that we were before. And so you, it's an act of self-preservation. It's not mere. It's to see tolerance is actually a lie meant to convince you to accept people to accept their own self-destruction. So meaning yeah. to say the, the most, actually the, the most tolerant of all people was in Germany was the most tolerant of all places in the world um, before um, and when the, before the Nazis came into power because they were able to use out the tolerance to um, then, uh, they had to be tolerated. It was like, well, that's, you know, people want to b- believe these kind of things. It's not a problem. They want to fight against God. They want to promote atheism and so forth. All, everything was tolerated until all of a sudden, Things were no longer tolerated that didn't agree with the, the proponents of the tolerance. So what when they say that you have to be tolerant, they're saying, accept that which is against your best interests. Accept that which is coming to destroy you, your family, your civilization. And the actual truth is that we're not supposed to be tolerant. We may be conduct ourselves respectfully towards another human being that has mistaken ideas. And we may say to him, good morning. And we may... Um, may uh, speak to him in a respectful way and figure out a way to, to try to show him the, the, that he's mistaken in a way that's going to draw him closer to the truth rather than drive him away. But we're not tolerant of that. If we allow, if we're tolerant of that, those ideas, then we end up becoming, uh, accepting them and they begin to grow. And they grow on not just the people that are, practices they grow on us also because if you make space for it just like i mean it just it's really very apropos over here if you start if anyone one of us starts to listen to the idolatrous music look enjoy the idolatrous pictures and enjoy the idolatrous smells we it's a it's we will lead into the why does it say that we'll end up in the same destruction that's that's intended for those things because we will follow after those things i mean hey, this stuff smells good Maybe I should start the thing and maybe I should go more often. Or I'm going to go to the, spend my time with these people and, and, and whatever they're doing. And they have beautiful images and they have all oh, the music is fantastic. So that's why we have to be intolerant. Okay. Any other questions or we continue? Thank you. You're welcome. I'm just going to mute you. Okay, oh, great. You muted yourself, so feel free to mute later on. So um, here we're talking about engaging in financial transactions. We're going to start a whole tra- a section here about money transactions. We're not going to get to complete it today. It actually goes on. We're on the fourth paragraph of this um, chapter. This chapter goes on for... Um, Twenty-eight paragraphs. So, um, so a lot. Something has to do with money and money. What money can you give? What money can you receive? If it was connected with idolatry, if the money is going towards something that's going to be used for idolatry, the money is coming from a purpose that, or from a sale of idolatry. Uh, so we're going to just start touching on this, and we'll continue next week. Um, so over here. The um, the, so we're talking about these gardens and these stores of idolatry. It's forbidden to rent from them. Um, you can't go and um, pay money to benefit them. And those that collect, what a gabai is like, um, a a uh, I'm not an officer, but a not an officer, but a person who's who's responsible for some communal affairs and um, either running something or collecting money. And so he's collecting money. That, um, that what is he collecting? He's collecting a tax for idolatry. It's forbidden to give money to this tax collector, to this person collecting the tax for the idolatry. Rahani Mili. So what's the situation we're talking about here? We're talking about a situation where the rent, the money that you're paying, the money that you're paying for this thing, uh, the tax, 
um, is going directly to the service, to the needs of the idolatry, or or for its beautification, and for its offerings. But if it's a law of the priests, and it's for the benefit of the priests, so let's say priests are going to take the money, they're coming around and collecting a tax. They're, they're, these priests are priests of idolatry. They're collecting a tax from the population, but it's going to go for their benefit. Um, they're going to buy themselves food, let's say. They're going to put, uh, you know, buy themselves a dormitory, or they're going to, the monks are going to uh, do their lawn uh, with your money. So, um, so they're not doing the needs. They're not doing it with it. They're not using this money for the needs of the idolatry. It's permissible to give the money, to, to give the tax. You're not making a donation here. You're not donating money voluntarily to the priests or the priesthood of idolatry. What's happening is they're coming and collecting a tax. So let's say everyone in this town or in the village or this neighborhood has to pay a tax to these priests. So now you're being taxed. So the question is, where's the tax going for? So if it's going for their needs, the priest needs, then it's permissible to give the tax. And even for where it's going to be used for the needs of idolatry, um, if the rent or the tax is going to the people of the country or the city, they're raising money for the sake of the city the, the, or the country. And from that money, they then use some of it for the needs of the idolatry. So what would the needs of them to buy the offerings for the idolatry, to paint the idolatry, to polish it, to build the structures around it, to you know, all these kind of parts of the, the service of the idolatry. Um, so if it's, if it's you're, but you're, you're not giving to the, um, to the uh, directly to the service of the idolatry, you're giving to the communal fund, so to speak. You're giving to the tax for the country or for the city. Uh, since the, uh, this money, this rent or um, tax is not designated specifically for idolatry. They take for themselves those that are collecting the money, take for themselves everything that they um, uh, raise. So, and then they, some of it, they then take and they use, uh, they, they return it to the purpose of the needs of idolatry. So it's now it's really as if they gave it from their own money. Meaning to say, the country or the state or the city, they collected your tax money, and now they take a portion of that. That belongs to them now. The tax collectors, the taxing authority, whatever the, the, the whatever governmental agency it is, um, um, and now they're going to go and they're going to build something of idolatry. So where's the money coming from? Well, it's true that you're a source of the original source of the money, but now it became theirs, and they're taking it out of their own pockets, so to speak, and they're using it. They're using it now for the idolatry. This is talking about a situation where this garden is not for the sake of idolatry itself. But if the garden is for um, is built for idolatry, and also if it's standing in front of the idolatry and close to it. So therefore, even in that case, in such a case, even though the rent is going to the priests, it's different than the where you're giving it for the priests for their own taking care of themselves. Rather, you're giving it to for rent for something that is right, is purpose is uh, part of this idolatry or is it's the service idolatry or it's right in the face of this idolatry. Also, this is also forbidden to pay this money. When it's not standing right in front of it, it's not a garden, let's say, right in front of the big statue of some uh, 
idol or person. Even though the money is going to the priests, mutar, it's still permissible. As long as that the money that you're paying is not going directly to the idolatry for the search for the purpose of the idolatry. So this is something that we can um, see, um, you know, especially in, in, let's say in countries like um, the United States where the government is not allowed to use its money for religion, then this is not such a problem. But we have a different problem where let's say the money is being used for other purposes to fight against God Almighty. Um, so it's being used to um, spread messages or force people to do things or fund things that are, are um, you know, forcing people to um, beliefs upon people. That's a, an atheism is itself a religion, as we've discussed. So that's that's itself pro that's a problematic thing. But in other countries where the the whole country is um, under the um, so to speak religious imperture of the religious, uh, you know, under the religion of a particular religion. So therefore the whole country is in service of that religion. Then you'd have to be aware of what um, your, how your money is being used and, and that you could pay the tax if it's a general tax, even though some of it's being used for idolatry. If you're gonna rent something, so let's say you wanna use a garden um, uh, that the priests own, but it's not, uh, devoted to idolatry. Let's say you want to make a, you know, a picnic there, and they'd say, "Okay, here is uh, the rent you pay." Or I want to go. I want to go into there. Um, I just want to go to the garden. You know, the botanical gardens. Um, I want to go there. So if even though the priests are operating it, but the 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 garden itself is not for the sake of idolatry, and the um, the Garden is not for the sake of idolatry, and there's no idolatry in it or next to it that it's this, it's clear that you're participating in this garden experience. It's really part of this um, honoring this idol. So let's say there's a, a garden that has no idolatry in it, uh, but the priests own the garden. Can you pay the entrance fee to go to the garden? Well, the answer is that the um assuming that the money is not being put, like if they have a sign that says, this money is going to go for the upkeep of idols, you can't go into the garden, even though the garden is not uh, idolatrous, because they're saying they're collecting the money specifically for the upkeep of the idols. However, they say that you're making this contribution, or you're making this entrance fee is for the purpose of uh, supporting the monks of such and such or the sisterhood of such and such and um then that's that's permissible because the garden itself is not idolatrous it's not in next to an idol it's not part of the service of an idol you're not giving the money to the service of the idols but you are giving money to idolatrous priests but they're going to use it for their own um upkeep some of that money they might then take and and use it to uh, for services or, or sacrifices or whatever offerings or incenses or whatever they do for their idols, but that's now coming from their pocket. You're not you're not giving the um, rent, the entrance fee, and so forth directly to that um, idol. So this is something that's really uh, really very practical. So you you would have to see that, for example, a non-Jewish person can't go on these tours of these houses of idol worship. Uh, especially in Europe, where the houses, the houses of idolatry are very, very prevalent, and even in the Holy Land, um, there are many houses of idolatry, and they become tourist attractions. A person cannot go into those places, and they cannot. They have to be careful, even if they're going to something that's not designated for idolatry. They have to understand how is the money, the entrance fee, um, going to be used. That's something you have to think about it and consider the application of this to your particular situation before you go in to that uh, and pay them the entrance fee. Obviously, even, even if there's no entrance fee, but it's clearly des designated for idolatry, you can't go in. And if it's part of this whole idolatrous, like a park 
um, that's in honor of that place. Like you go sometimes to, um, let's say in Washington, D.C. So you have uh, the capital of the United States. So you have these big, I think it's called the, um, I'm drawing a blank right now, but um, there's this big grassy area outside the Congress buildings. And um, so that grass, the area is, is not just, they didn't just happen to build, they, they said, oh, we want a park. That grass is part of the aggrandizement and the making special and the, um, the, uh, the uniqueness and the, the visit, the whole visit to this whole place is um, part of the, these gardens, this, this lawn experience is really part of that. So you, that would be an example. Now that's not intended as idolatry. So if you have, um, so let's say instead of the Capitol building in the center, that would be some big statue. And this garden or this lawn is kind of like, there's no statue in it, um, but it is leading up to it. It's part of the, um, like it says, Lefane, it's, it's before it, the idolatry is before it. It's, 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 or this garden is before the idolatry, meaning to say it's clear that it's part of this buildup part of the aggrandizing part of the whole experience of this idol, and that is not going to be permissible to go into it. Um, okay, we're going to pause here. Made some progress today. Any other questions? You're very welcome. Okay, thank you all. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week. There's other classes during the week, of course, but in this particular class, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. You're very welcome. God bless you all. Thank you, Robert. You're welcome. Bye now.